In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for everything you have granted us with this blessed day. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings, the joys, and the grace you have bestowed upon us. And we thank you, Lord, for the joy of your resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for coming down to die for us, to take away our sins, to remit all the sins we have committed against you, Lord, and to give us the joy of your resurrection and the hope of our own resurrection. We ask you, Lord, that you be with us in everything that we do. Help your joy reflect in our eyes, in our hearts, and in our faces, that, our light, that your light might shine through us. Let us be the light of the world and the salt of the earth that you have asked us to be. Lord, help us to help those who are in need. Help us to share that joy of your resurrection. Help us to be those that help the needy. Help those to be those that help the poor. And help us to be those that help the lonely, Lord. Please, Lord, be with us in everything that we do and help us become children that you'll be proud of. Pray this long to the session of Ascension, please, since the beginning. First and foremost, your mother, St. Mary, St. George, St. Mina, St. Barbara, and St. Polycarp. Please, Lord, hear us when we cry unto you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And let us not to deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for thine is kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. All righty. Um, welcome, everyone, to our first Bible study back since the resurrection. Now, today we are blessed with, I think her name is Mimi Aza, um, who's going to be continuing our Bible study. So if we can just make her feel welcome and Mimi, whenever you're ready, you can just tap on and start sharing. Okay, guys, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Fantastic. I also shared my uh, screen, so hopefully you'll be able to see me as well. Um, it's lovely to join you guys. Thank you for having me. Uh, I haven't done a lot of Bible studies on Zoom. <laughs> I've done a few talks and they were quite interesting. So let's see how a Bible study would work. Uh, what's the level of interaction? Do you guys want to um, show me your faces and share with me your thoughts and things like that? Yeah. That would be good. I still can't see anybody's faces, but okay. A few people are coming up. Yay. Okay, hopefully more and more will uh, will join so that I can see you when I'm talking to you. Um, we're going to do 2 Samuel chapter 20. So if you can all um, open your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 20. Um, and I'll start um, going through the chapter and then stopping bit by bit so that we can go through it um, in details. And then if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask. And then if you have any comments as well. Um, so this chapter comes after the incident, uh, the incident of um, Absalom's rebellion. Um, they crushed that and um, King David is coming back to take over um, uh, his uh, place as the king and sort of settling back into that role. So we'll start reading from verse one. Um, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. And there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bishri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, we have no share in David, nor do we have an inherit inheritance in the son of Je Jesse, every man to his tent or Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bishri. But the men of Judah from the Jordan, as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to the king. So we'll stop here. Um, so this guy, um, Sheba, the son of Bishri, is a Benjamite. If you recall, um, Benjamin is the same tribe that Saul came from. So uh, he's obviously against David because he's from the tribe of Saul and he knows that David almost took the, the uh, kingdom out of Saul's hand and out of their tribe. Um, and um, this, this rebellion is almost stemming from the previous chapter. If you recall, the previous chapter when the king, when the king was coming back to take over, um, the, the men of Judah, which is one tribe where David is from, came and they escorted him first and said, uh, he's our relative, 
Then the rest, the other 10 tribes of Israel said, uh, why did you go ahead and take the king and bring him back into, into Jerusalem? We have just as much 10 shares in David as you. But uh, again, based on the verses that we've read, the, the men of Judah's word prevailed. Um, so the expectation is this almost caused a bit of a second rebellion with that guy, Sheba, who's a, who's a Benjamite. And the word Sheba means, it's a Hebrew name, means seven or oath. Um, and um, as we said, obviously, they, he, he stirred up the people and made them um, sort of go away from David a second time. So um, out of this, we learn a couple of lessons. One, um, the, it's obvious that what was happening was not very natural. It's God's hand involved. The people were, were changing in this quick way away from David, whom we know that they've loved. First, they followed Absalom, then returned to David, and now they're leaving him to follow that guy, Sheba. So um, it's almost like they, they're following, and you can feel that this is really God's will and his divine intervention um, for the sake of chastising David, for the sake of um, almost teaching him part of the consequences of his sin from an earlier time. Um, and I, I think that is life in a way. So David accepted that second wave of problems in his life. It teaches us that in life, we will always have problems. Um, it might not be um, always for chastising or to make us better, but life is full of problems and issues generally. Um, so if you are close to God, it does not mean that life is devoid of problems. There are problems. Sometimes the problems are our own making, um, probably like the case of David. And sometimes the problems happen because life is full of problems and sin is in the world. Um, so a key lesson here is how do we deal with problems? How do we face the problems? And how do we manage the problems? And do we accept them? And do we feel that in every problem, God is trying to teach me something out of them? Or am I just whinging about problems that I have and, um, and I sort of not focusing on what God is trying to do in my life? Um, similar to the problem that we're in now. So we're going through this um, COVID-19 case. Everybody's stuck at home. Um, everybody's reaching almost the wit's ends that they, they had enough of staying at home and everybody's saying, when, when, when? Maybe instead of saying when and why, why is God doing this? Is this a punishment? The biggest debate that I've seen across everybody. Is God punishing us? Is God upset with us? Um, but God is not, you know, God is not that type of person. He doesn't, he's, he doesn't give us anything bad. Don't ask why. Similar to how, how God talked to Job. Huh? Don't worry about the why. Whether it's a punishment or not a punishment doesn't matter. What matters is what's my reaction to it. Um, don't worry too much about the why, but accept it and, and, and get a lesson out of it and see, okay, what do I need? What is God's personal message to me now so that I can change out of this experience rather than question what he's doing and why is he doing some of that stuff? Um, so that's one key lesson that I got when I read this passage. The other bit um, which was quite interesting how Israel, the, the 10 tribes just followed Sheba. So this is what I call the herd mentality. So uh, you, ju you just follow. Somebody comes up and says, ah, the, let's leave David. He's not worth it. Then people go through. Let's go after Absalom. They go through with Absalom. So they just move in this herd mentality. Um, and we're sometimes like this. We just follow the crowds. Um, this is the flavor of the day. Let's follow the flavor of the day. Um, we need to be able to stand and say, no, I'm not going to follow. Like imagine if, if somebody out of that, these 10 tribes would have said, no, 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 I'm not going to follow. I'm sticking to David. Maybe two or three tribes would have left the 10 tribes and, and moved back to David, but they didn't. Everybody just follow blindly without thinking, why are they doing this? Is this guy even good? You don't hear anything positive about him, except that he's just, he was leading the bunch in the pack and just saying, let's leave David. So obviously we need to be very, very careful with that concept of um, that herd mentality or just following for the sake of the crowd. I follow others because they're doing it. Not everything everybody's doing is right. And we have to be 
able to stand on our own and, and um, uh, not follow the crowd for the sake of. So that's, these are the first three verses. We'll keep going. We'll just read one more. Now David, verse three, now David came to his house at Jerusalem and the king took the 10 women, his concubines whom he had left to keep the house and put them in seclusion and supported them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. Um, so obviously these are the 10 women that were left in the house uh, of David when he ran away from Absalom. And as you recall in the previous chapters, Absalom slept with them um, in the middle of the day and everybody knew that they uh, slept with Absalom. So David almost said, look, you know what? Leave them on their own. He kept them in seclusion. He provided for them, but decided let them live as if they're, they're widows. He does not want to touch them anymore. Um, and I think that's fair. Verse four, and the king said to Amasa, assemble the men of Judah for me within three days and be present here yourself. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. Okay, we'll stop there. That's verse five. So um, Amasa, if you recall, was the um, head of the army of um, Absalom. Um, and just to understand the relationship between everybody, Amasa is actually David's nephew as well. So Joab is David's nephew and Amasa is David's nephew. Ama Joab is the commander of the army of David, current commander of the army. Um, Amasa was the uh, commander of the army of Absalom and they're both cousins. So Abigail, Amasa's mom, and Zoraya, uh, with, who is Joab's mother, are sisters, half-sisters, sisters, but they are related. So it makes Joab and Amasa um, cousins, okay? Um, so obviously David asked Amasa to lead the army to get rid of Sheba because um, it could be because of two things. Number one, I think um, it was a move from him to almost his way of getting rid of Joab um, because the, the relationship between Joab and David is a very interesting one. And I've read a few different views of the relationship because they say that generally Joab is a very hard hearted man. He's very tough, but he was very loyal to David and he, he sometimes did the right thing for him. Sometimes he did not obey him. So, but he's obviously a very, very strong character. Um, and he's obviously a very hard hearted man. Um, um, but it seems that David was relatively scared of him, um, either scared of him because of Joab's toughness or because he knew about the incidents of Uriah, the Hittite, who David killed. In all cases, I think David never liked the hardness of heart of the, the sons of Zoriah generally. He keeps telling them off because of how hard they are. When, even when Joab killed Absalom, um, he, he was, David was not happy. So generally, I think maybe it was a way, a move by David to try and get rid of Joab, um, or it could have been a way of telling all Israel that he's opening his arms to all of them uh, by putting Absalom's uh, commander of the army at the top. So either way, he was trying to sort of push Amasa to take control and go and do something um, by killing that guy, Sheba, uh, that was causing this, uh, this problem. Um, but obviously Amasa for some reason delayed. We don't know the reason for his delay. It could be because again of his of slackness from his side um, or just he didn't have the leadership influence. He's not a Joab. He's not a strong personality that is able to just rally the troops and get everybody very quickly. So he delayed a bit of time um, and rightly so David panicked a bit and did not um, want to to leave things with this guy Sheba the way it was. So uh, in verse six, we, re we read that, and David said to Abishai, now Sheba, the son of Bishri will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. So when Amasa was delayed, uh, David naturally goes to Abishai and asks him to get rid of Sheba. Abishai, remember, is um, Joab's brother. So they're both leading the army. They, they're, they're at the top. Um, in verse 7, it says, So Joab's men with the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men went out after him. 
and they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bishri. So obviously, um, Abishai goes, Joab goes with him, and all the, the Cherethites and the Pelethites is part of the army of, uh, of David. Um, some acted as his bodyguards as well, um, and they moved out to get rid of that guy, Sheba, the son of Bishri. In verse 8, um, when they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. I just thought I'd show you very quickly on my screen um, a map of where Gibeon is so that you um, can see. Can you guys see this, the, the, the map? Hello? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Try Maybe try sharing your screen. Let me try again and share again when I've got it open. Share. Okay, hold on. There we go. Okay. So um, Gibeon, where uh, Joab, um, when Amasa met Joab, is not very far from Jerusalem. So you can see this red bit. This is where Jerusalem is. And Gibeon is not very far. So it's just, it's quite close by um, from Jerusalem. So obviously Amasa had brought all the people that he's, he's, he's got. Um, and uh, Joab and Abishai had their people as well. Um, so going back, um, so actually you can stay on the screen. Um, so let's keep going. So verse eight, when they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. Now Joab was dressed in battle armor. On it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at, its, at his hips. And as he was going forward, it fell out. Then Joab said to Amasa, are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand, and he struck him with it in, in the stomach, and his entrails poured out on the ground, and he did not strike him again, thus he died. So obviously what happened at this point in, in Gibeon, not far away from Jerusalem, still at the beginning of the, tri uh, of the trip, um, Joab somehow got the, got the hold of his, um, um, of his sword, and he was, you know, almost, it's a, it's a betrayal. So he's holding him with his right hand to kiss him. And with his left hand, um, he has, um, he has, he struck him in his stomach. And it says that he did not need to strike him again. So obviously the strike was very strong that he killed him on the spot. So betrayal, there's no other way to explain it other than betrayal. Um, and it's interesting to, when we talk about betrayal, we just had Passion Week and we talked a lot there about Judas's betrayal. Um, it's a very similar situation. And you might think, oh, I would never do that. Uh, this, is, this is pure you know, betrayal. This is murder. This is very bad. Um, but I think you need to step back and say, okay, what's the motive? What's the motive for Joab to do that? What's the mo motive for Judas to do that? Um, I think for Joab, he, he obviously had a motive towards David. There is no doubt about that. But I think if you look deep, he's always wanted to be second in charge. So anybody that stood in his way to be the commander of the army, he got rid of. Um, across uh, the last few chapters, he's done that before. And now he's doing it again with Amasa. He, he wants to be the first. He wants to be the best. He wants to be the top. Um, there's a, a very big element of pride. Um, um, there is a love for his, you know, an ego. Um, and he can't take it. He just can't take it. Um, he was a hard-hearted man. Um, and for him, killing was very easy. easy but... I think at the end of the day, it's really his pride. Um, and as I say, we're not going to kill, but the question to us is, um, you know, how, how much does our ego stand in the way? Uh, what do I do for the sake of my ego? Um, what, 
who, who do I step on sometimes? And if I don't step on someone, do I get upset just for my ego's sake? Um, I might not be as aggressive as, as Joanne, but where does the ego sit in my life? And we need to be very, very careful of that because um, it leads eventually to big betrayals. It might not happen. The devil never comes and says, okay, now I'm going to make you betray and do something really bad. It's always a gradual thing. Um, and that's why we need to be very careful. Anytime I feel um, I get upset when somebody criticizes me, um, I, I don't say sorry very easily, M my, my ego is very important, then I need to be careful with these things. Um, the other thing about this guy, as we said, is his hard-heartedness. Like he just, he just killed a guy in, in, in cold blood and, and he's his cousin. Like it's not someone not related, but because he's taking that place, it, that hard-heartedness is something that we pray that we never, ever reach um, because it's a very bad place to be in where you really... Um, you don't care anymore. And you think, oh, I'm never gonna be like that. I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive, but again, it's a gradual thing. And you become insensitive, or I become insensitive in the small things. And then it gets bigger and bigger I, until I have a hard heart. So I was listening to something by Abuna Dawood the other day, and he was, he was talking about the, the Abuna Dawood Lama. He was saying, um, that there are lots of people that we are not sensitive to. We are generally, we judge them, we, mis we misjudge them, we, we think negatively of them. Um, we're not sensitive to their needs. So, and the best examples he was quoting are all the Lent weeks, you know, the, when, when the disciples saw the blind man, they were insensitive enough to say in front of him in his hearing, did this man sin or his parents? You know, like it's just in, insensitivity and lack of care and not seeing beyond the facade. And, and eventually, if we, if we keep judging people and being insensitive to people and being negative about people, um, we, we can become hard-hearted at a point in time. Um, so do I, when somebody does something wrong, again, that's a litmus test, when somebody does something wrong, how, what's my reaction? Do I give them excuses and I try and be sensitive to them and say, okay, Mahalish, they might have had a tough week. They haven't delivered on their service this week. How do I react? Or am I this self-righteous person that is always pointing fingers and this guy's wrong and this guy is wrong and this person hasn't done their job and, and, and. And I become a bit more hard-hearted and insensitive um, and that's not the way of the Lord. The Lord always gives excuses. The Lord always tries, finds the only thing right that the Samaritan woman says, and, and he clings to that and said, you said truly that you don't have a husband. So it's that soft heart to everybody um, that is something that we aspire to get to, to be similar to Jesus. Um, and we have to practice. We have to always practice giving excuses and trying and doing that stuff versus being that, like Joab, very hard-hearted um, and, and we don't care. The, the other thing that was obviously very clear to Joab um, as a principal, um, even though a lot of um, the fathers did not agree about his personality, um, for him, it's the means, the means justifies the end doesn't matter um, as long as this is what I need. Okay, so what if I, if I kill my cousin or kill Amasa or kill anyone else? Um, so what if I kill Absalom? So what if I kill this person or whatever? Because the end um, justifies the means. Um, um, it's a bit tricky because again, we need to be careful and not justify for ourselves certain things that we might do. Oh, this is a white lie. That's okay. I can do that. Or this is not cheating or this is not whatever. Um, we're just trying just to justify wrong things um, and make sense of them not for the right reasons. So again, something that we, um, we need to be very careful of.
Um, so again, talking about Joab and this incident, I think we need to be careful about a few things. One is, um, what is my motive behind everything? Who, who comes first? Um, Joab's motive was love to be second after David. Um, the hard-heartedness, soft-hearted um, concept and um, how do I use the means uh, around me to, to justify um, everything that I do. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Verse, um, the end of verse 10, then Joab and Abishai, uh, his brother pursued Sheba, the son of Bishri. Meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa and said, whoever favors jo Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. But Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the, men, the man saw that all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him. When he saw that everyone who came upon him halted. When he was removed from the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bishri. So this part explains that after Amasa was killed, remember Amasa was not coming on his own. He was coming with a whole troops that he's been collecting for a few days um, to be able to pursue Sheba, the son of Bishri. So, and David had his, uh, sorry, uh, Joab and Abishai had their own troops. So because Amasa was lying in the middle of the highway, wallowing in his blood, the people that are coming with Amasa that had been recruited by him stopped and, and halted and couldn't do up anything because they were seeing their leader in, in, in their blood, uh, in his blood. So he, the guy kept trying to tell them, you know, follow Joab because Joab is with David, just follow Joab. Uh, but obviously because the body was there, it didn't work. So this guy, um, who's one of uh, Joab's followers, took Amasa from the highway to the field, covered him, and then everybody followed Joab. So Joab had a whole lot of troops that he did not ha have before. He had all Amasa's troops with him, plus his own troops. Verse 14, and he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel and Beth Mecca and all the Berites. So they were gathered together and also went after Sheba. Then they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Mecca, and they cast up a siege mound against the city, and it stood by the rampart, and all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. Okay, so again, just to show you my screen, I think you can still see it, can you? Yes, we can. Okay. So this is where where we were talking before Jerusalem. If you go up all the way, this is Abel Beth Mecca. So he obviously kept pursuing him for a long time until they finally, in this village or city, he, he um, caught um, um, uh, Sheba inside the walls of the city. So he's, he's inside the walls of the city and they started to um, actually make holes in the wall so that they can make the walls of the city fall and then they're able to go in and capture that guy and kill everybody in the city. So obviously that was not a very good place to be in um, for that city in total. So let's go to verse 16. Then a wise woman cried out from the city, here, here, please say to Joel, come nearby that I may speak with you. When he had come near to her, the woman said, are you Joab? He answered, I am. Then she said to him, hear the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I'm listening. So she spoke saying, they used to talk in former times saying, they shall surely seek guidance at Abel. And so they would end disputes. I'm among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered and said, far be it, Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not so. But a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba the son of Bishri by name, has raised his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him only and I will depart from the city. So the woman said to Joab, watch his head will be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman in her wisdom went to all the people and they cut off the head of Sheba the son of Bishri 
and threw it out to Joab. Then he blew a trumpet and they withdrew from the city, every man to his tent. So Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. So this incident is a very, incident is a very nice one because this lady, obviously, so as we said, the city is very, um, um, he's stuck in the city. They're starting to, um, um, to pull the walls down. And this woman comes, a wise woman comes and tells Joab, come nearby so that I may speak to you. So um, he, she gave him a, a saying. The saying is in verse 18. It says, they shall surely seek guidance at Abel. They used to talk in former times to say that. They shall surely seek, which it means that um, almost why haven't you come to us to negotiate? We are, we are peaceable people. Come and seek guidance. Abel is the name of the, of the, of the village or the city. So come and seek guidance rather than come and, 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 and um, just act irrationally so that people can, they can end disputes this way. So in the past, it used to happen that in our city, you come and seek guidance and we end disputes. So she started by the same to tell him, look, we are, we're here to negotiate so that we end this peaceably. Um, let's try and, and, and solve it in a good way. Um, and it's, it's a fantastic way of starting a conversation so that she's trying to get to Joab. Obviously, we said Joab is by nature is a hard-hearted man. Imagine if she had started the conversation and said, what are you doing? You're stuffing us up. Blah, blah. She actually started by, by the saying to calm him down. And she explains her position. In verse 19, she says, I am among the peaceable and faithful in, in Israel. I want peace. I don't want to cause problems. Um, you seek to destroy a city and, and a mother. You, you, you're coming to kill us. Think about it. Why would you do that? Why would we swallow up the inheritance of, of the Lord? So the way she's talking is a very wise way, a very peaceable way. Um, and she was able to manage um, Joab. And that's why Joab answered and said, no, 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 I'm not trying to do that. I'm not, I'm not trying to swallow up the inheritance. I'm not trying to destroy I'm just trying to get hold of that guy. So I think what we learn out of this lady are, are two things, in my opinion. One is wisdom. And second is being a peacemaker. Um, again, wisdom is not easy to acquire because it reflects on the way you talk. It reflects on everything that you say. When you acquire wisdom, um, you act in a different way. And we all know Christ is wisdom. So when, when we acquire wisdom, we acquire Christ. Um, how do we say things? When do we say things? Is it the right time to talk? Is it the right time not to talk? And we need wisdom in everything. We need wisdom at work. We need wisdom, wisdom if we're studying. We need wisdom um, with our colleagues, with our friends. Uh, we need wisdom in the service. Um, and sometimes... We're not wise. We say things that hurt people. We say things that do not help. Um, and that's why we all need to pray for wisdom. We all need to pray for wisdom uh, because it's not something that is um, easy to acquire unless Christ fills us with that wisdom. And being a peacemaker, she, as I say, she could have said a hundred other things and it could have gotten worse, but she was coming with the attitude is we will make peace. Um, and as Christ says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. She literally avoided the, her whole city's death. Um, she was able to get to, get, get to Joab, manage the peace, negotiate with the people inside. Remember at that time, the women's roles was not, they're not top negotiators. Huh? So she comes in and negotiates and uh, is able to convince everybody that it's the right thing to kill that guy so that they throw his head and the whole city is saved. Um, and that is definitely the right decision um, at this point in time. And when, um, when uh, Joab sees the head of Sheba and then he blows the trumpet and they withdraw from the city and every man goes home. So Father Tedros Malati says, Sheba symbolizes pride. When man assumes that he is in need of nothing, a sickness, which also affected, you know, um, in the revelations when he talks about the church of the Laodiceans, 
just because you say I'm rich and become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Um, so you don't need anything like this guy. Um, he symbolizes pride, um, feeling of, you know, not self-fulfillment in a way. I think you do become that guy. Um, he, you know, he got his troops, he got, he created the kingdom for himself against David and locked himself in. But at the end of the day, the wisdom of that woman cutting off the head, throwing it over to restore the peace of the kingdom was the right thing. So we need to be very careful that we don't fall into that pride or else we'll be chopped off. <laughs> so the idea is always, always understand that you, you are in need of God more than he needs you. There is nothing that we can give God. Um, but we need to... Um, we need to always understand that we are more in need of him. Um, so the last few verses, we'll just read them quickly. And Joab was over all the army of Israel. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. Adoram was in charge of the revenue. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. Shiva was scribe. Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. And Ira the Jairite was a chief minister under David. So it's just recording who's doing what for David. So obviously, David left Joab in his position, never told him off um, about killing Amasa. Um, and um, again, if we, it might be because David was always scared of, of Joab, we don't know. Uh, but we know that for sure at the end of David's life, he tells Solomon, his son, that don't let Joab you know, die peacefully. He needs to be killed because he's killed too many people. So he asks his son Solomon to handle this thing. Um, so that's just a summary uh, of the chapter. Uh, a couple of things that I, I took for general questions just to summarize. Um, how do I look at suffering at problems in my life? Um, is it for me an unnecessary nuisance or do I consider it part of my growing in the Lord? Um, do I have this herd mentality where I'm following the crowd, like the, like the crowd, like the people of Israel? What is driving us? Um, is there a love more than the love of God in my life, like the way Joab wanted to be um, always in charge of the army? Um, is it, you know, do I carry hard heartedness in, in me? How do I treat people? Am I soft hearted towards them, especially that do wrong things? Um, how do I acquire the virtues of wisdom and peacemaking like this lady? Um, and how careful am I of the sin of, sin of pride in my life? Um, what do I do to handle it? Um, so these are some of the thoughts. Um, I'll stop here and please let me know uh, if you have any questions or comments. Okay, I'm assuming no questions or comments. You've got this thing. Yeah, go for the ninja keys. I'll definitely play it. Yeah. All right, well, it looks like there's no further questions. So thank you very much, uh, Mimi, for your Bible study. Um, so after after this, we're just going to conclude with prayer. And after prayer, as usual, Christina's prepared for us a Kahoot. And we've also got other games that we could play if you guys would like. So um, stick around if, you, if you're if you keen to play. And Abuna, if you can just conclude us in prayer, that would be awesome. All right, it looks like a bonus not around. Mimi, can you conclude us in prayer, please? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean, our dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the chance to stand together and sit together with your word. We thank you, Lord, for the quietness that we had during this lockdown uh, to spend more time with you and with your word and 
just to rethink our priorities and see what we want to do with our lives. We beg you, Lord, that you bless each and every person on this call and all the others that couldn't make it. Give them that direction and clarity so that they um, enjoy that time with you and help us all to realize what the resurrection means for us and how can we stay focused on you as our first and only love, Lord. Um, we beg for your mercy. We beg for your direction. And we know that you're always doing the best for us. Help us, Lord, to live that resurrection and not to lose that um, high from Passion Week. And we continue to be thinking about you and about heaven um, and serve you with all honesty. Bless this meeting, Lord, and guide everybody that is there through the intercessions of your Holy Mother, St. Mary, and all your saints. Hear us, Lord, when we pray and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to leave you guys. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for the Bible study. God bless you. Okay, have a lovely night. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.